Open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. We have been in the book of Romans for a while now. And uh, we're going to finish the book of Romans. But um, after Easter, which is April the 17th. Uh, so invite your friends to uh, our Easter service. April the 17th. Um, after our uh, Easter Sunday. Uh, so the Sunday after that, we'll be starting a new uh, message series on the church uh, and uh, kind of leading up to our sixth anniversary, which is in August. So it'll be six years in August since we started here at Grace Fellowship Church and an exciting time. But we're going to enter into a new sermon series uh, after Easter talking about the church and what the church should look like according to the New Testament. Um, how to serve in the church, what does it mean to be a gifted member of the church, to be in covenant together. Uh, and then also we're going to talk about church leadership, missions, several different things that involve being part of the New Testament church. And so I want to invite you to anticipate that, to be a part of that um, coming up. But until then, we are going to be uh, continuing in the book of Romans. Chapter 11 today is where we are. Now, Tommy got a little bit ahead, and he jumped all the way over to uh, the end of Romans 11. And um, I'm going to rewind us back to uh, verse 1. And we talked about that. We're like, hey, is that a good idea? And he, he asked me, he's like, can we do this? And I'm like, of course. We're preaching the word. Doesn't matter where you are in the Bible, does it? As long as you're preaching the Bible. Uh, that's, that's where we want to be. And so the, the great thing about God's word is God never contradicts himself. He's the same yesterday, today, yes, and forever. And so his word never gets old. Uh, I've been a Christian for uh, many years. Um, I've been in the ministry for, I've been a pastor for about 20. Before that, I was a youth pastor. And it never fails. Every time I prepare a Bible study or prepare a message and I open up God's word, he always speaks to me in new and fresh ways. Have you found that to be true? I have. I hope you have too. Uh, and every time we open up God's word, God through the Holy Spirit is going to build upon something, some foundation he's already laid in your life. And so you just get more and more of God's word, more of the Holy Spirit uh, teaching you. And um, so you can never go wrong. But we're going to rewind back to, for some of you uh, young people, rewind um, is it, like hitting the back button, okay? It, you're going backwards, um, how many of you can remember having to rewind VCR tapes before you return them? Wow, Ryan, I'm so proud of you. You were the first one to raise your hand. You're just going to own it. I remember, I remember Blockbuster Video. <laughs> we're going to rewind to uh, verse 1. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10 today. As we discover who the people of God are. Who are the people of God? Who are God's people? Uh, this is a phrase that is used uh, many times today. Uh, we are the people of God. The church talks about us as of, we are the people of God. Um, throughout history, people have considered themselves the people of God. They've talked about themselves that way. Uh, different denominations will consider themselves the people of God. Um, others will consider Many denominations within Protestantism as the people of God or everybody under the larger Christian umbrella, including maybe the Roman Catholic Church of ages past and as being part of the people of God. In this time period where Paul is writing, he's specifically addressing the people of God throughout history and what God is doing in a new sense in the New Testament in Jesus Christ as Jesus is establishing his church. If you remember from a couple of weeks ago, um, I think I mentioned the, the time when Jesus said uh, a very famous saying, talking about his church. He says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church. The word church in the New Testament, the Greek word ekklesia, is a compound word. Some have suggested it's, it's, that it means to, to be the called out ones because it's a compound word. The first, the prefix ek means out and then kaleo is the verb to call. 
And so the, the early church, if you go into the New Testament, that word church is the Greek word ekklesia, the called out, the people who have been called out of this world, out of darkness, as Peter would say, and into Jesus' marvelous light. So these are people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. These are people from all across the world who have this one common interest, and that is Jesus, the person and work of Jesus Christ, the people of God. Paul is going to reiterate through Romans 11 and through the whole book of Romans that the people of God are people of faith. To become a person of God means to be someone who has been chosen by God's grace through faith in Christ. That's how a person becomes part of the people of God, the community of God. By God's grace through faith. And Paul is going to remind his audience in Romans that there are going to be many throughout time that think they are part of the people of God when in fact they were not and never were going to be part of the people of God because they never had faith in God. They never believed God's word. God would continually give Israel, prophets and teachers and kings and people like that that were to serve and to specifically administer God's word to the people. To say things like this, thus saith the Lord, this is what God says. That's all they were to do, to be God's mouthpiece. And, and the hearers, the listeners of that message became the people of God in as much as they believed the message of God. Okay, this is very important. So we're going to learn three things about the people of God. Who are God's people? Number one, and we're going to revisit these in a moment, but number one, God's people are foreknown by God and not always known by us or known to us. Number two, God's people are chosen for God's purposes and rejoice in that. And then number three, God's people live and move solely by God's gracious choice. So let's get into the text. Romans 11, 1. Paul writes, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel. Lord, they have killed thy prophets. They have torn down thine altars. And I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What then? That which Israel is seeking for, it has not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and, hear, and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. Let's pray. Father, we ask today, Lord, as we come before you, Father, as your Holy Spirit administers your word to us, God, give us ears to hear. Give us hearts and minds to receive it. Speak to us according to your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. We get this sense of Old Testament theology coming through to the New Testament. A lot of language that the Apostle uses here in his letter harkens back to the Old Testament. And so we're going to look at some scripture passages from the Old Testament to get a better understanding of what he's communicating and how we're going to apply it to ourselves today. But number one, the first thing that we notice 
about God's people in this passage, what he tells us is, is that God's people are foreknown by God and not always known to us. Look at what he says here, starting in verse 1. He asks this question, and remember Paul is giving this set of rhetorical questions throughout this section of Romans. He's asking these questions, and then he's kind of answering them for us. But he anticipates the questions that his readers might have, especially that the Jews might have as they read this. He says, I say then God has not rejected his people, has he? Now this goes hand in hand with the question that he asked in chapter 10, if you remember that, and the question that he asked in chapter 9. Let's just rewind a little bit again to chapter 9. He says in verse 6, It is not as though the word of God has failed. So the question is, has the word of God failed? Has his promise failed since he did promise to Abraham that he would multiply his descendants as the stars in the sky, as the sand on the seashore, and that those who bless Abraham, he will bless. Those who curse him, he will curse. Does that not carry on through all of the blood lineage of, of Abraham? So that all of his children and grandchildren and everyone who's related by blood are partakers of the promise? Isn't that how it works? So if there are people during the New Testament times and today who are Jewish by blood but who don't accept Christ, if they're rejected by God, does that mean that God's promise in the Old Testament has failed? God's promise has come short. It was faulty in some way. He asks that question and then he answers it. And he says no. He says in fact, not, it is not the children of the flesh, this was in verse 8, who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. Remember that? Not all of Israel are descended from Israel, he says. There is a sense of a spiritual Israel. That is those who have followed the example of Abraham in his faith. Now, Abraham was a work in progress, wasn't he? He failed many times. You go into a place and lie about the identity of his wife, Sarah, because he, he just did not believe at that time, yet strongly enough, his faith was not strong enough that God was going to provide beyond Abraham and Sarah's physical abilities. They were older in age. Sarah was known to not be able to have children. And so they thought, well, we've got to wing it we've got to come up with our own plans they learned over time that God was faithful and that he was going to bring about his promise but it was only through faith but when we get to chapter 11 he asked the question has God rejected his people he answers again in the emphatic way that he's answered all of his questions emphatically up to this point he says meganoita may it never be no, the most emphatic way to say no in the Greek, he uses that phrase. We won't use the most emphatic way to say no here this morning in English, but you get the drift. Why? He says, because I too am an Israelite. I'm a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. He's saying, I am a Jew. And God decided to save me by his grace when he opened up my eyes. To see who Jesus is. He came and he found me. I didn't think that I needed finding. Paul would have said, look, I was, a, I was a Hebrew among Hebrews. As to zeal, I was a Pharisee. As to the law, I was perfect in all things. I was the best of the best. But he says, when I encountered Jesus, I considered all of that gain as rubbish, as garbage, literally as a dung heap compared to knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, whose sake I have given up everything that I may know him. Not that I've already arrived, not that I've become perfect, but I press on. I press on, he says. So it's not as though God has rejected his people because Paul says, I'm one of his people, historically speaking, according to the bloodline 
of the tribe of Benjamin. Verse 2, God has not rejected his people, he says, whom he foreknew. Now this is really interesting. Because Paul is going to distinguish between people who we think are the people of God externally and the people of God who are actually foreknown by God who are his children, who he's chosen by his free grace. God's people are foreknown by God, but they're not always known to man. Now, there are other places in Scripture where Jesus says, you will know them, and Paul says, you will know them by their what? By their fruit, right? There are ways that the Spirit of God is manifest through your life to where we can see your life and you can see our life and we can see the fruit of the Spirit. We can see God bearing fruit in your life and we just see, man, that, that person is bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I, I know that person is a believer. I see them broken over their sin. They don't ignore it. They're not hardened by it. But they're constantly repenting of their sin. They're always lifting up Christ. They're not selfish toward other people. They're selfless. They're giving. They're serving. Not that they would earn God's favor, but they're serving and they're giving and they're worshiping out of gratitude for what God has done for them through Jesus But there's this idea of a remnant, of a group of people, a small group of people within a larger group of people. This idea of a remnant comes from the Old Testament. If you'll hold your finger there in Romans 11 and turn back to Haggai chapter 2, chapter 1 in the Old Testament. I might have to go to my index to find Haggai. So if you do, don't don't feel bad, okay? It's one of those prophets that are tucked away. Hey, I found it. And it's only two pages long in my Bible. It's one of the shortest, shortest books of the Bible. In Haggai chapter 1 and 2, there are only two chapters, but in the book of Haggai, uh, the, the problem with God's people is they've come out of captivity and they should be rebuilding the temple. They should be investing in the, the, the worship of God. And instead of doing that, what they're doing is they're taking, they're taking uh, God's blessing and they're building their own houses. They're investing in themselves and in their family and things like, things like that. And so when we come to uh, verse 12, 14, and then we're going to see the word again in chapter 2, verse 2, there's this repetition of this word remnant because there's a group of people within that larger group who have decided they are going to Respond to the word of the Lord in faith. So in verse 12, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltil, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people. So a group within a larger group. The remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people showed reverence to the Lord. We see it again in verse 14. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltil, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the, what? Remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. We see it again in chapter 2, verse 2. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. You can see all all three times, this is just kind of a repetition of the same group of people that God is zeroing in on. And this is what happened through their captivity and through all of God's testing. There was a great group of people called Israel and called Judah who God led through the wilderness, but there was always this remnant, this very small group who responded affirmatively to the word of God and said, yes, Lord, we will go. Yes, Lord, we will wait on you. Yes, Lord, you will be our helper. We won't go to Egypt. We won't go to Assyria. We will wait upon the word of the Lord, this remnant. Paul says the same thing in the New Testament. There is a remnant. So there are believing Jews within the larger group of Jews in the Greek-speaking world at this time. Some of them will be saved. Some of them will put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So it's not as though God has rejected his people. 
It's just coming to an understanding of who God's people actually are. Many times they're not who we think they are just by looking at the outside. And so as you look across the the world today and you see steeples across America, there are buildings where people are worshiping. And not all the people in those buildings are born again, are Christians. Because not all of them have put their faith in the person and work of Christ. They've dabbled in religion. They attend sometimes. They might have a family member who's influenced them. And they're rubbing elbows with other Christians occasionally. And polls are taken by Barna and all these others who would say, well, there are X amount of percentage of people in the United States of America in 2022 who claim to be Christian. But we know in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out many demons? That's not your average religious person, is it? That's actually a person of religious authority. That's probably preachers. (laughs) Leaders. Did we not... Did we not cast out many demons? Did we not teach others? Were we not in places of authority? And Jesus says, and I will say to them, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, because I never, what? I never knew you. I never knew you. Salvation is not so much about people having the opportunity to, to, to get to know Jesus. It's more about Jesus knowing people and calling them to himself by his grace. And so we preach the gospel, we share the gospel with people knowing that God is going to call them to himself, those people whom he foreknew. He says in verse 2, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel. Lord, they have killed thy prophets, have torn down thine altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. In 1 Kings chapter 19, this is what Paul is referencing, this account where Elijah the prophet is being hunted. He's being pursued by an Egyptian king or queen? No, (laughs) by his own leaders of God's people who are attacking the prophet of God because they don't like what he's saying, the message that he's delivering. So they're going after him. And Elijah comes to this place where he's like, there is no one else. There there are no other people of faith within God's elect group, the Israelites. And so he cries out to God, he says, They've torn down your altars. They've rejected your word. And they're coming after me. And there's nobody else. I alone am left. It is all me. It's all down to me. And Paul asks, what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the need, the need to bail. Now this is interesting. This is interesting because... Elijah would never have said, I alone am left, if he knew that fact, would he? If he had known there were 7,000, he would have never cried out to God and said, I'm all by myself. See, God was doing something that Elijah didn't know about. And I believe that God is also doing something in this church, in your family, in relationships that you have with other people that you might not know about. I think he's doing that all the time. I think he's working all the time. And we might not know exactly who are the people of God, but he does. He does. And he's called us to be faithful to his word and to trust him that he knows all of his children. Amen? God's people are foreknown by God and not always known to us. The second thing we notice is God's people are chosen for God's purposes and they rejoice in this. 
I heard a brother the other day use the word rejoice, just talking randomly with another person. Yeah, I heard that, and I was just standing there rejoicing. And who uses that word anymore, <laughs> right? Rejoicing. It made me happy or, or whatever. But what does it mean to, to really rejoice? To really rejoice to be used by God. To get joy. Not to just be content. You know, I, I'm content with the fact that God is using me for this, even though I'm not maybe crazy about the assignment or whatever. No, but to really get joy from being used by God. Are you joyful about being used by God? You know, we have to be careful in the, in, in the church today about placing different types of service above others, different giftings above others. Because we, we tend to, to kind of rank things. So, you know, I, I could be really happy if God would use me in this way or in this way over here. I would, I would be really grateful and thankful and joyful if God would use me in these other ways. Would you be joyful just to be spent completely for Jesus? Notice what he says here in verse 4. Because this is the key. What is the divine response to him? Going back to Elijah. I have kept, for who? For myself. Folks, don't, don't, don't minimize that phrase. I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And then he goes on to say in verse 5, in the same way there is a remnant. So as Paul is ministering, as Timothy and Titus and Silas and Barnabas and all of these missionaries and pastors are ministering in the first century when persecution is going to ramp up and people are going to be beheaded and sent to the gallows for their faith. To understand what he's saying here to Elijah in verse 4, when Elijah says, I feel like I'm all alone, God says, you're not alone. But those 7,000 are not meant for your agenda, whatever it might be. They're not even meant for your expectations. They're for me. I've saved 7,000 for myself who have not bowed the knee to Baal. That's what being foreknown and chosen by God means. All things are from Him and through Him and to Him. He's going to say at the end of this chapter, God's people are chosen for God's purposes and rejoice in this. Paul is going to say in the book of Philippians, he's going to say, even if at this point in my ministry, as I'm writing from prison, even if I'm being poured out as an offering on the altar of your faith, I rejoice. I rejoice. Remember that time in the New Testament where Jesus is reclining and he's with his disciples, is in the home of two women and one of them breaks open a vial of costly perfume and anoints his feet with it and pours it on him. And some of the disciples say, what a waste. That could have been used for the ministry. The things that we think Jesus needs. And Jesus says she gave what she had. She gave everything that she had. Her most expensive, what she was saving, she poured it out for Jesus, holding nothing back. This is going to be a common theme in Paul's writing. But we see it again uh, in Jeremiah chapter 13, as we go back to the Old Testament again. I want you to see this. Jeremiah, just after Isaiah... And this is a theme that's not just here in Jeremiah 13. It's all over the book of Jeremiah and Isaiah and many of the prophets. This idea of God's people. Who are God's people? In Jeremiah 13, 11. This illustration is given. As the waistband clings to the waist of a man, 
So I made the whole household of Israel and the whole household of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people, for renown, for praise, and for glory, but they did not listen. God is going to, in His grace and in His wisdom, reach into that massive lump of clay that we discovered in Romans chapter 9, that massive lump of humanity. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none that are righteous, not even one. He's going to reach into that humanity and He's going to pull people out and use them for His purposes. Some will be like Pharaoh, who God uses for His purpose. But even though Pharaoh lives his life and sees God's glory, he is going to say no to God's invitation to let his people go. And his heart's going to be hardened. God chooses people out of the lump of humanity in that way. He chooses nations like Israel that way. But not everyone in that lump will be saved. Because it's only by grace through what? Faith. Through faith. When people talk about America being a Christian nation today, there are people on both sides of that issue. Some will say, no, yeah, America is a Christian nation. You know, we should be praying at ball games and, you know, we should be, you know, doing all this, I don't know, all this other stuff. We're a Christian nation. Be able to pray in the classrooms and, you know, teachers should lead prayer and all this other stuff. And others say, no, America is not a Christian nation. No nations are Christian nations. The church is the body of Christ and we're to influence, you know, nations and pray for our leaders and things like this. People on both sides of this issue. When we talk about America being a Christian nation, you might say, well, America is a Christian nation if you go back to the founding documents and the founding fathers and kind of their worldview. Many of them were Christian, but many of them weren't. Some of them were just deists. They weren't even theists. They believed that there, there was a God, but that he was not even involved. And he certainly wasn't the author of the Bible. And he didn't move the authors of the Bible to write what they wrote. Many of our founding fathers, when I say ours, I mean Americans, were were deists. Many of them propagated the philosophies of John Locke more than they did the law of Moses. That's just a fact. So when we talk about the people of God... If you ask someone on the other end of the globe today in some other country, what type of country is America, they would answer, America is a Christian country. Just like in the same way you would say that Iran or some other country over there is a Muslim country. But you also know that not every soul that lives there is a Muslim or a Hindu. Just like not every soul in America is a Christian. Not every soul who meets in a Christian meeting place is a follower of Jesus Christ. So who are the people of God? Who are the people of God? The people of God are foreknown by God, not always known to us. The people of God are those who are chosen for God's purposes and rejoice in that. We're not chosen... For a denomination's purpose, or a country's purpose, or a church's purpose, or a leader's purpose, but for whose purpose? God's purpose. And whatever that purpose is, we don't just say yes. We don't settle for what that purpose is. We rejoice in that purpose I want you uh, to listen to these words of Paul in Philippians chapter 1 verse 12 he says now I want you to know brethren that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole praetorian guard and to everyone else And that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. 
The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, rather than from the pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice in prison, having his name drugged through the mud, rejoicing and continuing to rejoice. Whenever he writes to the young pastor Timothy, he uses the same language. Again, chapter 1, verse 12, in 1 Timothy, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, and yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. And yet for this reason I found mercy, in order that in me, as in the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. He says that he's thankful that he has been chosen as an instrument in the hands of a holy God. And whatever, whatever the God who foreknew him and loved him and called him, whatever that holy God called him to do and appointed him to do and chose for him to do, he rejoiced in. He didn't do it kicking and screaming. So folks, this is why as a church, you know, when we talk about we talk about seek, like seeker friendliness in churches. We want to be friendly to everybody, always. Jesus was, right? To be open and to be friendly with everyone, to be accepting of everyone. But folks, we don't sugarcoat the gospel, right? We don't change the message. Why? Because God foreknows every single person that he is going to, by his grace, reach into that lump of clay and pull out. And the way that he does that is through the faithful preaching of the message. People like you and me who tell others the truth. The truth about our sin before a holy God. The truth about the way that we're saved. The truth about what a Christian life looks like as we walk on this journey. But we have to rejoice. We have to rejoice in that truth. Not sugarcoat it, not change it. Rejoice in our suffering. Rejoice in whatever it is that God has called us to do. And to say as Paul did, in everything, I just want to please Jesus. I just want my life to be pleasing to him. Whatever he wants, wherever he leads, I'll go. And then finally, God's people live and move solely by God's gracious choice. It's the only way we can operate is by God's gracious choice. When Paul went to the Areopagus in Athens in Acts chapter 17 and he he shares with those philosopher types, uh, he says, I'm gonna declare to you a God that you have a statue set up to but he has no name because you just kind of erected this just in case you missed somebody, you know? He says, I'm gonna declare that God to you, the one that you don't know about. And then he says this about him. He says, he doesn't dwell in human, in in temples made with human hands as though he needed to be served by anyone. He says, but in him, we live, move, and exist. We all live, move, and have our being in him. It's all about him. God's people, that remnant, that special group of the called exist specifically for his glory. God's people live and move solely by God's gracious choice. It's the only way. So in Romans 11, he says in verse 6, but if 
It is by grace. It is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Grace has a definition. It is not just a religious word. Something that is on a t-shirt or in the name of a church. Grace has meaning. It has teeth. It means something. It has substance. And a, and a, a grace that has anything to do with human merit, human actions, human decisions, is not really grace. God is free in salvation. God freely chooses who He's going to manifest Himself to through His Word, who He's going to call to Himself. It is all God's grace. God's people are not just those who talk about grace, are not just those who belong to churches with the name grace in it, right? God's people live and move solely by God's gracious choice. The old hymn, Amazing Grace, I once was lost, but now I found Jesus. Wait, that's not how it goes, is it? I once was lost, but now what? I am found. Who's performing the action there? God is. He found me. He snatched me out of the enemy's hands. When that truth grips you, that God has done that for you in Jesus, your life will never be the same. Ever. You will say to God, whatever you want, whatever you have designed for my life, it is all yours. Take my life and do what you will. He has found me. We're not, we're not, found, we're not finders. We're the found. We're the found. God finds us through Jesus, through the message. Paul says, what then? That that which Israel is seeking for, it has not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it. And the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. See, that sounds really harsh. That sounds really harsh, the, the description of this hardening. Folks, when, when God takes a life when he, when he pulls us out of the miry clay, it's all his work. And if he doesn't do that, the natural process in the human life, in the soul, because we are fallen, we are sinners, in the hands of a holy God. And if he doesn't rescue us, we continue down that path of hardening and bitterness and envy and strife and hatred. We continue down that path. It's only until, only until he reveals himself to us that we can be changed. We don't change ourselves for God. And, and one of the things that's infecting, we talked about America earlier, one of the things that's infecting America is this new, found, it's not really new because it's kind of the same things that the devil's been doing for ages, but this new repackaging of Christianity, and it's not even Christianity. This health and wealth gospel, which is not good news. Gospel means good news. The health and wealth gospel, the, the gospel that has all those little pithy sayings that you see on Facebook about doing better today and today I'm going to be a better me and you know all these other things of self-help and believe it, claim it, 
all that stuff, all of that, all of that language is powerless and pointless. Do you know why? Because it sends you back to who? Yourself. It sends you back to yourself, back to yourself, back to yourself. It's empty. It's powerless. Speaking things into existence because you have the power to do that. You have the, if you speak in faith, it will come to pass. That is so blasphemous. God is the only one who can speak things into existence. You know why? Because he has holy lips. He, has, he, he is holy. We don't have the power to do that. What we do have the power to do is to go to God's word under the Holy Spirit's leadership and guidance and to say, this is God's word. He is able to do whatever he desires according to his word and through me. And he will. But this infectious philosophy of pointing us back to ourselves and saying it's by your seeking, it's by your power, it's by your wisdom, it's by your passion that you can get yourself into God's good graces. It's not grace at all. Grace is real. Grace is substantive. It means something. And it means that God does according to His will. He saves a remnant out of the nothing. When there appears to not even be but one soul, there are 7,000 that he's doing work on that we don't even know about. Praise God for that. He's working. He's working in that remnant with people who he foreknows. He's choosing people who are going to be joyful about being chosen. And you can see it in God's people will continue to live and move solely by God's gracious choice. Let our lives reflect our joy for being chosen by God. May God's Word and the Holy Spirit drive us back to that point of understanding we are nothing apart from His grace. And let us share that, be faithful to share that with others. And know that when you think you're all alone and there's no one else, you're not alone. God is working all the time. Let us be a church, Grace Fellowship Church, that can truly be called the people of God. Now, Jesus says in the New Testament uh, that among the wheat in the field, the crop, there are going to be tares among the wheat, right? Don't go in there and tear it all up. <laughs> He'll do that. He'll do that later. And so as a church, we will never be in the business of being the faith police. But we do have a church covenant that we revisit, revisit each year. That we will call you to and call one another to to say, we believe in Jesus, that he's God's son, that he died for me, for members of the church who come and profess that openly to the watching world. We will covenant with one another. And that is one of the ways, also with baptism, that we publicly say, we're God's people. I'm one of his. I'm not hiding he chose me and I joyfully enter into covenant with the rest of the body of Christ and joyfully will serve Jesus as my king in whatever capacity he calls me and gifts me to. Let us be God's people. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, God, for your word today. Lord, that you are holy and that you are righteous. God, that you call things into existence which do not otherwise exist. You alone have the power to make believers, to make Christians, to build your church, 
to save the lost, to spread the gospel. Father, help us to rely on you and your work, knowing that you're sovereign. And God, that we would be joyful to be instruments in your hand, whatever our job is, whatever our calling is. But that we would be living and moving and existing for Jesus. That our faith would not be compartmentalized to one part of our life only. That our relationship with Christ is not just one relationship, personal relationship among many. That our service to you would not just be one small thing that we do in conjunction with a lot of other things, but that we would understand who you've called us to be and what you've designed us to be in your kingdom. God, that we would be joyful in that. That we would be fueled by grace. That we've been found. That we've been chosen. And that our identity in Christ is all by your mercy. Lord, let that joy and that passion fill our veins as long as we have breath. In Jesus' name.